Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we share with you an Around the Yard segment where we give you some great tips on helping your lawn survive the summer heat. Yeah, here we are, Danny, right in the middle of summer, so I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to be leaning in to hear those tips. And we have a special guest, Chelsea Lipford-Wolf, will be coming by to talk about her latest project and check it in with Chelsea. And if you've got a woodworking project, but you're not highly skilled, this is a great project. You need very few tools. And even if it's your very first project, you'll be able to successfully tackle this one. You know, Chelsea is having tremendous success with all of her videos on checkinginwithchelsea.com, but also on her YouTube channel just surpassed 5 million views. So wow. her, her style of home improvement is very, very popular, and she is, do, she is doing something all the time. Hey, an, another thing that uh, people are considering is uh, replacement windows. You know, there's a lot of different windows out there, but one of the more popular ones are vinyl windows. They used to kind of have a bad name. Nowadays, there are some good quality windows out there, but how can you select a good quality vinyl window? Because it's such an important part of your house. We'll give you some guidelines and some thoughts along those lines and i've got a simple solution how to make sanding especially the sanding the edges the narrow edges of boards how to make that go a lot quicker and a lot more accurately have we got you interested i certainly hope so let's get started Hey, it's time for our Around the Yard segment brought to you by our friends from Pavestone. This time of the summer, things are getting pretty hot wherever you live. And we often talk about protecting ourselves from the heat, and that's very important. But it's also important to think about protecting your lawn from the heat. Heat is one of the biggest stresses for a lawn, so what can you do to reduce that stress? Well, watering, that's a no-brainer. Uh, when it's hot, you get thirsty, so does your lawn. Now, if you walk across the grass and it sounds crunchy, or stays bent down, it really needs water. And you want to water early in the morning to minimize the evaporation. We spoke about this a little while ago. And speaking of walking on the grass, that's another thing that causes stress. So when it's really hot and dry, try to limit any foot traffic as much as possible. Now, while fertilizers help feed the lawn and and it'll push to create new growth, it also causes stress. So hold off until the weather cools down a little bit. Finally, this is very important. When you cut the lawn, be sure to remove only the top third of the grass blades. You guessed it, removing more can cause stress. Plus, taller grass plants develop deeper roots and that makes them more drought tolerant during the dry, hot summer. This Around the Yard segment brought to you by Pavestone. Very, very important this time of the year. Uh, Sometimes you may skip a few days and need to mow that grass and then you you keep yep. your um your your uh, mower set at the same amount and it really does i mean you can look at um plants like that that you've cut half of the blades off and you can see how it's frayed and stressed like that so it is is it's like so many things you do around your house the more often you do it the easier it'll be to get that done very very important yeah and as you said the most important thing is not to cut it too short some people think well it's growing so much in the summer i'll just cut it really short but that stresses out the grass and then what happens when suddenly a drought a period of drought comes and you know if you pay for water i do not because i'm on a well but if you pay for water you can be putting out a lot of water to try to sustain that grass in fact a couple of weeks ago danny i shared a simple solution i think there were five or six tips for helping a lawn survive a drought stricken period now it's not how to keep your grass lush and green it's just how to make it survive have it be strong enough that once it does start raining that then it can come back so and uh, you can actually see that article right now on today's homeowner.com just Go to todayshomeowner.com in the search engine there, put the five ways to um, help your yard survive, and you'll get not only that article, but several other ones that'll uh, help you uh, make the right decision because, uh, boy, uh, uh, fertilizer, that's one of the things that people think about during this time of the year. Not a good time to do it when it's hot like this. Over the last uh, week, uh, I've been in a couple different attics. One is 
Chelsea's buying a new house. I'm very excited about this new house that she's buying, and uh, you'll hear a lot about it because it's a lot of work that's going to be done there. And uh, but th- but I was in that attic and realized um, how important it is to uh, another thing that you can do. Maybe not in the afternoon, catch this one first thing in the morning, but maybe get in that attic with a good uh, flashlight and check a few things. First of all, um, extremely important to make sure uh, that the the vents around your overhang or soffit area are working like they should. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one thing. If you have soffit vents, which are little slots and louvered slots that you see on the overhang, the eave of your home, which which allows fresh air to flow up between the rafters, and there's nothing there, you know, they just work by convection. You don't have, there's no motor, no nothing. They work really well. But if you stuff insulation deep into that corner of the attic, you might be blocking the airflow. And people think, well, more insulation is better than less insulation, which in most cases is true, but you can't pack it in there. It should be enough space that the air can flow up between the rafters and out, typically a ridge vent or gable end vent. So yeah, that's the first thing to check if you're up there. And the other thing, Danny and I always say, if you go up into your attic and you can see the top edge of your floor joists, you don't have enough insulation because they're probably only you know two by tens and you need in most places you need 14 to 16 inches no matter where you live in the country of attic insulation and that'll help you every day of the year summer winter and so forth also another thing is if you have a power roof vent that's controlled by a thermostat you need to check it too you can take a small screwdriver turn it down to 80 or 90 degrees which most likely your attic is at least that temperature if that fan doesn't come on then either the fan is bad or the thermostat is bad either one very easy to to repair and that can save you a lot of money hey right now dropping by the studio is checking in with chelsea's Chelsea uh, to uh, talk about uh, her July segment that's coming up and uh, an episode that you just completed. That's right. Um, It's online now at checkinginwithchelsea.com. Hi, Chelsea. How are you? Hey, guys. I'm doing great. I'm even better because of my most recent project is all about um, building a planter stand for plants. So plants make me happy. So this project made me happy. Okay. What did you use? What does it look like? Um, And uh, how hard was it? Well, inspired by one of our most recent um, Today's Homeowner episodes where we used a bunch of cedar wood, Um, it's I made it out of a one by two of cedar, which is readily available um, at our Home Depot, at least. And um, I think it cost a little over six dollars for this piece of lumber. So I had all the other tools and necessary things on hand. So it, you know, cost me less than seven dollars to make this cute little planter stand. And it's so if you can picture one by twos um, as the four legs, and then there's a crossbar and but that connects all the legs together, but it's recessed about two and a half inches down from right, the top of right. the legs, so mm-hmm. the planter kind of nest down in there. And um, it's super easy to build. I did use um, a pocket hole jig, which sounds complicated, but is actually um, really easy to use and just makes everything um, look more polished and finished. And um, then I set it out on my front porch, put my little planter in it, and then you can... Um, I like it because it adds height to your plant. So if you have two or three plants situated together, you build a planter stand, you have one, you know, 14 inches off the ground, and then you have one on the ground, and it just is like a cute little plant vignette on your front porch. I like that. And I suppose, and because it's cedar, you can use it indoors or out, because cedar, red cedar is is naturally uh, decay resistant. Right. Um, And I guess the cross pieces that support the potted plant, you could put it higher or lower depending on depth of the plant. Exactly, yes. And you could build two or three of these planters at different heights. Exactly. And that would give, I could see that looking really great on a, on a front porch of a home. That's right. So I used, I did, um, built one at 14 inches and then I actually built one, I think it's about 22 inches high. Right. And you can use it for a planter, but I also used it for our um, fancy water filter that we have. It's like a canister style water filter. And right. so I use it indoors inside of our pantry and our water filter sits on top of it, but there's like enough room underneath it to put a cup and use the yeah. little um, spout that comes with it. So that, there's lots great. of versatile yeah. uses for it. Did you have and to you apply ha- a finish? Excuse me, Dan. Did you have to apply a finish? Because it's not really necessary, but did you? No, yeah. I, I didn't because I was so anxious to to get it in use. But, um, yeah, you can just put a wood sealer on it and right. – um, 
Great. You can add some shine or just close off the pores of the wood. Well, that's one of the things I was going to suggest. If you have more of a rustic type look, you can just use, you know, turn the rough side of the cedar out. And right. like you say, you could just put a, a coat of clear sealer on it. But if um, if you have something that you want it to be painted, then really you can use the smooth side of the wood and you can prime and paint it so that it fits in with just about any decor. Yes, I love it. So you can go see the how-to video at checkinginwithchelsea.com. And there's a lot more on checkinginwithchelsea.com than uh, than you can imagine. Many, many different um, episodes that Chelsea has done over the years, a lot of other videos. And uh, tell us about social media, a lot of different ways people can interact with you there. That's right. I love um, playing around and sharing on Instagram. So my handle is um, at Checking In With Chelsea. So easy to remember. You can go follow me there. All right. Well, thanks so much for dropping by the studio with us today, Chelsea. And we'll definitely be checking in with Chelsea again very, very soon. It's time for our best new product segment brought to you by The Home Depot, how doers get more done. If you're painting new surfaces inside, it's important to prime them first. And if you're concerned about indoor air quality, you need to pay attention to VOCs. Those are the volatile organic uh, organic compounds used in many paints and coatings that create that new paint smell, but it can have an adverse effect on your health. A new general purpose primer from PBG boasts zero VOCs. It's a great fit if you want a healthier home. It does what you expect a good primer to do. It seals new surfaces and bonds them to create a better foundation for the top coat. It also has great adhesion and a vari- on a variety of surfaces and it helps hide previous paint colors. Because there are no VOCs, it has low odor so a space can be painted while it's occupied and it's Green Guard Gold certified for low chemical emissions. So for more information about PPG's interior general purpose primer with zero VOCs, just drop by homedepot.com. That's PPG's interior general purpose primer with zero VOCs. That's one of the things they're responding to, Joe. A lot of people are understanding low or no volatile organic compounds and what it means. So the manufacturers are responding to that. So um, good for them. Especially indoor painting. Exactly. It's less of an issue outdoors, of course, but indoor you paint two or three rooms and you get that smell going. Sometimes it lasts quite a while. That's two right. Or three. Yeah. In fact, when I lived in New York City, the paint, this is going back quite a while, long before zero VOC paint paints were available. If suddenly bugs or cockroaches or ants or something showed up in your apartment and they weren't there before, it was often because someone was painting next door. Oh, That's what is they that discovered. Right. If someone painted an apartment next door or across the hallway, yeah. the paint... And I'm, Imagine it's driving cockroaches out of you. How good, is, how bad is this stuff? If it's driving co- Meanwhile, the people are sleeping in there. So, yeah, that was a serious concern. So I'm glad to see these zero VOC coatings coming out. Right now, we're going to go to Nebraska, and Bobby's on the line. Bobby, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. How are you guys doing today? We're great. We are doing just great. We always have so much fun uh, cutting up and uh, talking about uh, home improvement and hopefully being able to help people with some of their uh, challenges, just like we want to help you with this uh, window issue you're dealing with. Tell us all think, about it. I think we spoke to Bobby not too long ago, Danny, yeah, didn't we, Bobby, that. about another issue? Yes, actually kind of related. I had called. We live in a house built in the 40s, and I don't know if you remember, I was saying it had great sound insulation and concerned if I got replacement windows because the windows are the original oh that's that I right would lose mm-hmm. the sound insulation remember that yeah certainly do so, yeah and we we said it would probably help it probably will and just a quick note joe i, I remember you saying i had talked about ins- not doing insulation because it's a brick house and i didn't want holes around the brick right and then you mentioned you know you can do it on the inside well we have plaster walls i right. don't want holes in all plaster walls <laughs> well that would make it a little more difficult than a drywall but it's still yeah. better than better than punching holes in the outside. So how how can we help you today? Yeah. Anyway, so okay, here's here's the issue. Um, we are seriously noodling getting the replacement windows now. And this one contractor that we've used in the past, he's very good, um, very good reputation in the area. He's using a brand of windows we have never heard of. I mean, there's the big three, but his brand I've never heard of. And so we got to thinking, well, how do we know? or how do we find, excuse me, good ratings, unbiased ratings for windows? Because you can always read reviews, and either somebody is really grumpy because something happened, or they're <laughs> right. over-the-top happy. And it's like, I just want an unbiased 
review of Windows, and I didn't didn't know if that was out there somewhere. Yeah, well, that, that's, a, that's a good question, and one of the things, you know, years and years ago when vinyl windows really started becoming popular, um, little um, manufacturing facilities, uh, using that term a little bit loosely there, because uh, just buildings popped up everywhere and people started creating vinyl windows, and they were not up to standard, and they were just really not a good thing to put in your home, and uh, so um, a lot of uh, research that should have gone into these were just simply not, and a lot of these uh, windows failed. However, during the economic decline back in 08, 09, and 10, um, a lot of those, most of those companies went away. Now, whether or not with recent uh, economic times, some of those um, subpar companies have come back, um, I'm not really sure. Joe, what do you think in terms of, do you know of a good resource like that? Because I'm with Bobby, you can go online and, and it's all over the place with right. some of these, and you wonder how unbiased it is. What, any thoughts on that? Yeah, Bobby, first, if you found a contractor who you really trust, who works in the area, and he's installed these windows in the past, he wouldn't be installing them if he's getting callbacks. If, if homeowners are calling him six months or a year later or, or less and saying, you know, these windows are failing, he wouldn't be continue to install them because he makes no money going back. You know, he makes money installing them. So you might have to kind of trust them. Yeah, good point. But I can tell you a couple of things. Well, first, I don't know of any place that rates vinyl windows because as danny said so many of them are made locally um if it's not pella or anderson or somebody like that it'd be kind of hard to to uh, get a rating on them but a couple things to look for first you want welded corners where the sash and frames the extrusions are come together you don't want screws and brackets and everything else you prefer welded corners um and the the extruded vinyl that makes up the frame in a window should have several internal air chambers so there you don't want just like a u-shape a squared off u-shape chain you want something full of chambers which adds strength rigidity but also it traps air so it makes it, the frame itself much much more energy efficient and like any window obviously you want a higher r value not a lower one you might get one as high as two or three as opposed to one um and double lifetime warranties. A lot of the sash, the sash themselves, will have a double lifetime warranty against condensation um, problems. And of course, Energy Star, if it's an Energy Star qualified unit. And the other really important thing to look for on any window is some is the NFRC rating. That stands for National Fenestration, which is basically glass. National Fenestration Rating Council. They'll have a gold seal certification on certain windows. So that's another thing to look for. Um, but again, if this is a locally made window and it's a local contractor who installs them all the time and he loves them and he hasn't any problem with them, I'd probably trust them. Okay. You know, that makes sense, Joe. That really does. The things that you've listed. Is, yeah. Okay. I think that has helped us a lot. I'm glad because it is hard with something like this because some people think they're just a commodity or just windows. All vinyl windows are the same, but it's not. It's like any other product nowadays. They used to all be pretty cheaply made, but now they're really good, great uh, vinyl windows or some that aren't so great. And on the installation part of it, uh, Bobby, it's well worth uh, talking to the contractor since you have good rapport with him. And just say, hey, when you, in when you install this, um, are you using any tape to go around them? Because it's very, very common to use a membrane tape to go around the flanges of the window. And what about any gaps? Are you, you going to caulk it? Are you going to foam it? Just make sure. I assume that they are going to, but it's well worth asking that question so that they know you're aware of the proper installation of And then everything should work out great. You know, I am actually going to sound like I know what I'm talking about when I talk to him next time. That's this the spirit. Awesome. That, that's right, Bobby. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's right. Have that bit of swagger. Just go in there and swagger on in and say, let me sit, just tell him to sit down and you want to talk about Windows. That's the way to do it. So. Hey, maybe he'll hire me on his crew now. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Exactly. You've got potential. I agree. <laughs> hey, Bobby, get back in touch with us. Let us know how this works out once you get those new Windows in. I sure will. I sure will. Thanks so much, guys. You have a great okay. day. You too. Our pleasure. You as well. Thank you, Bobby. We also love emails, and we receive a lot of them at todayshomeowner.com slash ask, just like this one from Eva in South Carolina. Um, she asked, how can we cover an inch and a half gap under the wood door that leads uh, from our kitchen out to the porch? What? Wow. Wow. Inch and a half? Inch and a half. Apparently, the threshold is missing because generally you would have a threshold. I've never that heard comes of that. 
comes up, you know, a little ways, and then you may have a door sweep under uh, the door. But this is going to be, you can add something to your bottom of your door that'll bring it down. But I think you're going to need to go the other way and look at a, what they call a high boy threshold that will be positioned on the floor. And that will close, that should close that gap. Sometimes you can have the little door sweep that you can install, either a U-shaped door sweep that goes under the door or you might have one just on the inside that closes up against that. Either way, Eva, you need to take care of that. I would head to the home center and look at the weather stripping aisle where they have the thresholds, and you'll find something that'll close that gap. That's a pretty significant one there, Joe. You think? Yeah. I, it's almost <laughs> like a doggy door if you have it really small. Yeah, I've never heard of an inch and a half gap. And um, my only concern is if you filled it like inch and a half with the threshold that would create a tripping hazard because you're not really expecting to be like stepping over a two by four every time you went in and out of your house uh, maybe she can make up some by attaching like a three-quarter inch piece of wood to the bottom of the door then add a three-quarter inch threshold i'm not really sure split the difference on it like yeah. that in order to make it down but i'll bet the threshold's just completely missing you know, they may have had like a piece of three-quarter inch wood down and then yeah. the threshold on top of that. And maybe it's not an inch and a half. Maybe it's an inch, but looks like an inch yeah. and a half. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm assuming Eva measured it, but maybe maybe she didn't. But yeah, another thing is if you have a wood threshold that's not sealing tightly against the bottom of your door, it's not going to be an inch and a half, but it's not sealing tightly. Look at the very top of it. You might see either a really wide diameter slot that looks like a screw that's flush, and there's a spring-loaded um, mechanism underneath that. And if you loosen those screws up, that rises up or drops down. There might be a little plastic cap over it. You can pry that up and see the screw head as well. Most people don't realize that those thresholds can move up and down because of those springs that are underneath it. And that's a great thing to check on uh, any house that you may have. You just just lay down on the floor there and really look under that threshold. So often, one side will be tight, another side's not. It's a very, very simple um, uh, adjustment that you can make. And not only is it an energy efficiency issue, it also will keep a lot of those little critters out. Because if they have a little way to get in and out of the house, whether it's uh, roaches or lizards or spiders or whatever, they're coming in, so you want to block their path and let them go to the neighbor that maybe is not paying as much of attention <laughs> or maybe that neighbor is not listening to today's homeowner radio each week and not getting all of these great tips so and if you're laying on the floor danny be sure to lock the door before you start peeking <laughs> underneath it because sure as i can tell you someone's going to come in that door as, come as in with a handful of groceries yeah. and then they they bonk you on the head and drop <laughs> eggs right on exactly. your top of you there that that's not what you want Joe always seems to come up with something that really solves some of those aggravating problems that we have around the house. What about this week, Joe? All right, Danny. This one, earlier we were talking about sanding the edge of boards, three-quarter inch boards, sanding the edge. You often have to sand them because they they come from the store rough or you rip the board down to the proper width. And, of course, you have saw marks on the saw. So here's how you do it. Um, you can save a lot of time by sanding several boards at the same time, which is a technique known as gang sanding. So you take several boards, you have three, four, five, six, doesn't matter, and clamp them all together with the edge that you want to sand facing up. Check the boards, make sure they're all perfectly even, of course, perfectly flush so the surface is nice, flat, and even. And then you can sand all the edges at the same time. Now, that not only saves you time, but this is really the simple solution I've discovered. It doesn't matter whether, especially if you're using a belt sander, but even if you're using a random orbit sander, if you sand one board at a time, it's almost impossible to keep that belt sander or even the random orbit sander flat and square on that edge. You're almost always going to round over an edge or sand at a bit of an angle. So this virtually eliminates that because you're sanding, of course, on a much wider surface. So that's all you need to do is clamp them together, make sure they're even at the top, and then to sand all the boards at the same time. Boy, that's another good, simple solution. You can find over 500 more at todayshomeowner.com slash simple solution. Now, the Today's Homeowner Hotline is uh, very, very active, and a lot of times we have callers that come in, and they don't leave us um, you know, they're, they're any way to get in touch with them, but they want answers, and we want to help them out, and we're going to tackle a few of those right now, starting with Margaret in Michigan. I got to repaint my barn, but I'm thinking about staining it. All the paint is off of it, and I was thinking probably an oil-based stain would be better. Would a semi-transparent be better so it would soak into the wood? 
Uh, Margaret, you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, if you if you get a good stain job on there, first of all, you're only going to need one coat. You want it nice and even. Uh, you can spray it. You can roll it. But no matter what you do, you want to take that big, wide brush and force it into the pores of the wood. And you can pick out a number of different colors. But buy a good quality, semi-transparent stain, and you just can't go wrong. It's a, a, and you're talking about a sizable project here. So explore maybe renting an airless sprayer that will help you apply the paint. But again, that back brushing is very, very important. Let's go to Bernie right now in Virginia. I've got brick that some well water had sprayed on it, and now it's got phosphorescence on it. And I tried lime away. It didn't work. Uh, tried muriatic acid. It didn't work. I'm, I'm wondering, is there a way to get that white chalky coating off of my brick? Okay. Well, Bernie said phosphorescence. I think he's probably referring to efflorescence. I mean, unless these bricks are emitting light and shining, which is what <laughs> phosphorescence would be. Um, so, and he said white chalky coating, so it certainly sounds like efflorescence, which is simply caused by natural salts leaching out of the bricks. Um, and the, the word efflorescence actually comes from the French meaning to flower out because the salts flower out. They kind of blossom and bloom out of the brick surface. And ordinarily, you can just remove it by simply brushing with a stiff bristle nylon brush or soapy water. So I'm not sure why lime away or muriatic acid didn't work. Now, he did say well water sprayed on it. So maybe it's a, a mineral. Maybe it's some kind of calcium. But either way, um, what I would do is move up to something a little stronger, but still environmentally friendly there's a product called green envy masonry cleaner or simple green has a lot of products they make great products and they have one called concrete cleaner and that would work on brick as well so, so that's what i would suggest okay let's go to cynthia in alabama i'm considering buying another property however i witnessed sort of moisture on the wall in this new home because the bathroom is very small is there a specialty type of paint i should paint that bathroom with to make sure we don't have that uh, wet look in the bathroom to prevent the moisture, I guess. Okay. Well, Cynthia, it is um, a good idea to go, to paint with a good quality uh, paint. Um, eggshell finish is uh, is is really what's the most popular because it uh, provides you a cleanability. It holds up very very well, but. You don't need paint. You need ventilation right now. That's absolutely right. Obviously, uh, moisture is getting trapped in that bathroom. And um, to put a simple fan from Brown or Newton in the ceiling, uh, you can wire it to your existing light so that it comes on when the light comes on or um, have a separate switch is really what most people prefer. But the key thing is you want to make sure it's sized properly for the room. And most importantly, it, it is vented all the way to the the outside that may go through the roof in many cases if your um, uh, outside walls close by you might be able to loop it over to a soffit vent and vent it out of your soffit but either way it needs to uh, have a clear path so that you can turn that on and then you're not going to have any moisture in there that's going to move all that hot moist air out that's created by the uh, toilet by the sink by the shower and so forth and move it all the way to the outside and like we continue to remind everybody use your fan not only when when you're in that shower, but for 10 or 15 minutes afterwards so that you're getting rid of all of that hot, moist air. You do that, you won't have any sweating, and you won't have any moisture in it. So um, something that we can't uh, remind people enough, though, Joe, is uh, how right. important it is to, on that ventilation. And, and also, um, if you've been a longtime listener of ours, you know we talk a lot about um, how over the years houses have become more energy efficient, how they have sealed the envelope of the house more. That makes uh, moisture problems more of a problem so moving that air out properly is absolutely necessary yeah and like you said not only should you run the fan you know for 15 minutes or so after you shower but go up into the attic or wherever this fan is venting and make sure it's venting outdoors it's amazing how often danny and i've been saying this for how many years now danny and we still get callers and emails that they found the vent is just dumping air into the right. attic well guess what happens you know that moist air is going to cause problems moisture problems in the attic so check make sure first of all that it is indeed working take a one sheet of toilet tissue or a, a facial tissue and toss it up lightly against the fan while it's running if it doesn't stick then something's not working properly it doesn't take much to hold that tissue in place but so that would show you that the fan is working the duct's not 
clogged up, but then also make sure it is venting to the outdoors because you want to get that moisture out of your house. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week, and we would love for you to send us a question, and we will certainly answer as many of them as we can. You can send one right now to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Eileen in Maryland asks, I have a 40-year-old rancher with a basement. The chimney, which was put in after the house was built, is starting to separate from the house, and I'm not sure exactly what to do. I've had various people come out and take a look at it, and they've all given me different advice. The chimney at one time was used for a wood stove in the basement that hadn't been used in years. So what should I do? Number one, have it repaired. Number two, tear it down. Number three, rebuild it. Please help. Oh, man. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, I know exactly, Joe, and you know exactly what we're talking about here. Most likely this chimney's on a gable end or certainly on one of the exterior walls. And then they notice up right by the wall of the house, a gap is forming, which is terrible for water getting in and so forth. But we're talking about an extremely heavy and potentially dangerous piece of of masonry that's, um, you know, vertical. It may go up 16 feet. It may go up 35 feet, but a tremendous amount of weight there. And then obviously it was not built properly, or there's a lot of water intrusion around on the a foundation part of it that's starting it to shift. But I don't know, Joe, I'll tell you, I've never seen one to be able, even with all of these new fangled um, hydraulic systems of lifting right. foundations, I'm not sure I've ever seen one that was actually able to be corrected. Well, if I'm understanding Eileen's question correctly this is an easy call it doesn't appear that this chimney's in use it's obsolete so i'm not sure why it's up at all if it's coming down i say let it come down hire a contractor and pull it down you're right it's not something a homeowner should do don't tie a rope to it and tie it to your car because your car might be 30 feet away and it might be a 40 foot tall chimney so that'd be a problem but um yeah i I would definitely um if it's not in use it's obsolete take it down water is definitely washing behind this and may not really harm the bricks much but i'm sure it's rotting out all that wood and if that continues to happen you definitely don't want this thing falling on its own because I mean, we're talking about a potentially dangerous, lethal situation there. So um, if it's not in use, take it down. If it is in use, then you're going to have to have a mason come out, and he's going to probably have to take it down to the foundation, fix the foundation, rebuild the whole thing. Now, I'll tell you what I did on one that was not a very big gap there, but you could see it was starting to shift. We actually braced up the chimney significantly with some uh, four by sixes and uh, some significant stakes in the ground just as a, as a little support. Then we actually dug directly under the um, backside of the chimney, and we found that it was only about eight inches of concrete there. Well, we dug right. down 16 inches uh, and made it come out a little bit, which was below the ground level and out on each side a little bit and then we poured about uh, almost a half a yard of concrete in there with rebar and then allowed it to sit there for about a week then we took the braces down filled it back up we did another project for these same folks um, a few years later and they said it had not moved at all so oh, we, you know, we, we didn't repair it, but we stabilized it. And again, it was not a very big gap that uh, we were able to put proper flashing in it. They caught it at the right time. Right, and that's right. something that Eileen is faced with right now is you don't want to sit there and ponder this for a while. Either do some um, remediation now or go ahead and take it down. But a foundation expert should be able to advise you on that and hope we've been able to help you a little bit on that, Eileen. And again, if you would like to send us a question, do so at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And I always like to say each week, thank you so much for taking the time on the five-star reviews we've been getting many, many times. We we appreciate it. It means a lot to us, and it makes us want to work that much harder to bring you the right kind of home improvement information that we're known for here at Today's Homeowner. I'm Danny Lifford, along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thank you so much for spending a little time with us on this Today's Homeowner podcast. 